Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to my Daily Dose with Tim. Today is Season 2, Episode 57. So we are, wow, 57 episodes into a 60-episode series at this point. I hope you've enjoyed the previous episodes so far. And I know, I know, I got to address the elephant in the room. Some of you guys have been texting me, messaging me, checking in on me to see if I'm okay, because it's been a while since I put anything out there. And yes, admittedly, I'm totally fine. Just been having a little too much fun traveling now that the world's kind of opening up a little bit more. And uh, the other thing also is that I really wanted to make sure that I do not repeat too much content, even though really every single day I get inspired by the questions that my students are asking, my mentees are asking, and some of you guys have really opened up to ask questions as well. And that's exactly what this platform is for. Now, admittedly, I do not check my Facebook a lot. I just, I'm here to produce quality content to put it out there and share with everybody. If you do want to get a hold of me, you can easily, easily find me and reach me at Tim. I'm going to write it down for you at trustyourtalent.ca. So very, very straightforward. If you do have any other in-depth questions, you can email me and um, I will make the time to connect with you and to help you however I can. Now today I'm really, really excited about the topic that I have set out uh, today simply because it's one of my favorite, favorite subject to touch on. And why is that? It's because this to me is the guiding light of how every single educated and professional investor should behave. And I know it's hard to sometimes, and I will tell you this, even after over a decade of being a trained and educated investor and now being a real estate investing mentor for years, sometimes I still have to continue to remind myself to stick to the ground rules and stick to the formula. First thing first, if you've never heard me talk about what SMP stands for, you better write this down. Because this is how you're going to be able to create multiple streams of income and long-term financial wealth and successes for yourself. So S stands for strategies and M stands for markets and P stands for properties. Now, this is a process so it's not just that we randomly select three different words that sound great that's related to real estate together. It's the fact that this is truly a process. And now the reason why I say it's a process, it's simply because every single one of us choose to learn how to invest more strategically, more wisely, and more carefully, and more securely for one reason. And one reason only is to hit a certain financial goal. So this is why the financial goal always comes before determining the strategies that will be a good fit for you. Simply because of the fact that when it comes to mapping out a financial blueprint for whether it's you as an individual or you and your partner, your spouse, or you and your family, whether it's immediate family or extended family, doesn't matter. It is not one size fits all. Most of us don't buy one size fits all clothing these days. Why would we do one size fits all when it comes to one of the most important resources, resources at our disposal these days? And that is money. And so there will always be a money goal as sort of our guiding light. Now, the true guiding light above that really is what we call your why. I'm going to write this up here. It's your why. And so really, I mean, I know sometimes some people will look at this and go, it's getting a little philosophical. And if you remember during the early days of Daily Dose with Tim in season one, I did go into discussing a little bit of your why, basically finding your purpose. Now, not everybody is blessed to really figure out what their why is, what their purpose is, and it's done through trial and error and through collecting life experiences, the good and the bad and the ugly. And so with that said, it, is, it can be a moving target. So when we're referring to your purpose in life right now, it's your purpose in life at this particular moment in time. 
And so I will share this with you because once upon a time, my why was very, very simple. And I'll add also add very dumb, very stupid. Why? I mean, I can say that because it was me. I'm simply giving myself feedback. It's one of those things where if you can look back 10 years, what would you tell your younger self? Now, 15, 20 years ago, like everybody else, I was very much trapped in the old school mindset, go to school, get a good job so that you'll be well taken care of. And then my why really only was simply just to get good jobs, get a good corporate job, especially climb that ladder. That was the only formula I knew and work hard, give everything you possibly can do, you know, go the extra miles. And that was it. And to the point where once I achieved financial freedom, I decided that my why is to start helping others do the same thing. Now, some of you already know that uh, when I achieved financial freedom, when I declared financial freedom, it was, a, it was an amazing day. It was amazing, amazing healing. And at the same time though, three months le- uh, right after that, I actually went back into a minor, minor depression mode. Why? Because all of a sudden I realized it is only so fun when you get to do whatever you want every single day. So once I declared financial freedom, I was watching a lot of movies watching a lot of TVs. I was uh, learning how to take care of myself better. So um, finding, sourcing, making more nutritious meals. And uh, many of you also learned that I was recovering from a third heart attack as well. So health was a big thing. I was learning, um, practicing yoga and uh, HIIT training and Pilates and um, started mixing a little bit of weight training, which was something that I was not advised to do for a very, very long time. And it was so fun to so many people, even to myself back then, that was sort of a dream come true, not having to wake up at 6.30 in the morning and get ready and check your emails and then fight through traffic and then hoover down an unhealthy breakfast just to get to your first meeting or the office on time. And uh, so that to me was a dream came uh, come true. And when it actually came true, it only lasted so long because I realized okay, well, I can do all those things for myself and by myself. But then I started getting a little bored. (laughs) And so what happened was, I mean, instead of staying at home, walk the dogs, play with the dogs, watch TV, play video games um, and, and take care of my health, I also mixed in maybe a little shopping here and there. But then sometimes I want to go out for a lunch with my friends during the day and they were not available. Why? Because they were all working. And so that was really my aha moment. And I recall one of the mentors that I had in that journey. And he goes, when you achieve financial freedom, it just simply means that you now have the options to choose to work on what you want to do rather than what you need to do to pay the bills. Because when money is no longer an object or a problem for some people. What are you going to do with your time? Because now you've managed to buy your time back. And so it was through some soul searching that I realized that I, if I could ever, ever help another person achieve what I had achieved, I think that would be really meaningful. I think it would give my life some purpose. And so at the time, not, every ha- not everything happened in perfect timing because I actually started going back to, uh, to look for a job, to look for a career. Because many of you know that I went to school for marketing and I really wanted to work at an advertising firm. And I managed to land uh, jobs with ad firms. However, at the very same time, I was contacted by the training academy that I took my uh, training through and they asked me if I would come back and be a trainer and a mentor so that I could actually empower others and to accomplish what I have accomplished and show others how to do that. And so that really all of a sudden aligned with my value a lot. And I will tell you, I mean, the corporate job positions that I landed Definitely initially looked a lot more lucrative. However, it 
space, it didn't, it didn't really tickle my fancy as much as the idea of being able to empower somebody else. And so that purpose started to get more and more solidified. And uh, sidebar, I actually did also apply to work at a Starbucks as barista three times, but got rejected because um, I, I don't really know because they never they never really contact me, uh, contacted me. It was just a rejection uh, email. I think the third time there was even not a single uh, correspondence back from them. Anyways, I digress. The only reason why I wanted to apply to work at a Starbucks was because on my vision board, one of the things that um, I truly enjoy is a good cup of coffee. And I also really like Starbucks. And usually when I mentor, I always like to joke, well, I don't have an office. Every single Starbucks in the world is my office because that's where I work out of. That's where I meet a lot of my investors, my mentees, my students, my power team members, if we're not meeting at their offices or wherever they would like to meet. So on my vision board, not only do I love coffee, I wanted to also start my own coffee shops because another friend of mine also had that aspiration and we thought it would be really cool to go into business together at some point. But neither of us had the barista experience at that point. So we just wanted to do that. Now, fast forward though, as I mentioned, I was fortunate enough to be invited back to start to train and mentor. And as that started happening, even though, even though it, it, the money wasn't great, actually, it really wasn't. <laughs> but the idea is I started to realize what kind of impact I was able to create in the world. And this is why within the Trust Your Talent community, we have five different core values, and they are health, sustainability, joy, fulfillment, and impact. When you're able to achieve financial health, physical health, mental health, and making sure that they're all sustainable and you're happy, you're truly happy from the inside out and you feel fulfilled, the last thing you do, and it's not even just what you get to do to, in my opinion, it's an obligation. You're, what you're obligated to do is to give all that back out into the world. And this is why impact is such one, uh, is one of the uh, five core values within the Trust Your Talent community as well. And so my current why, all that really is to share with you in case it's not evident already, is to share with you that really helping people achieve financial freedom and financial independence or really just financially empowered is my current why. And it has been my why for quite a few years now, as many of you know. And so with that said, my why translated into a financial goal. Now, I'm very, very privileged to say that I am in a very comfortable position where if I really don't have to do anything, don't start another business, don't take on another job, I'll probably be pretty okay for the rest of my life. However, again, purpose, what is my purpose? You can only have so much fun and do the same thing over and over, over again for so long before it kind of loses its value and appeal and most importantly, meaning. And so I realized it wasn't just about me anymore. It was about making sure that anybody that needs a hand up, not a hand out though, anybody that needs a hand up receives it. Because I remember once upon a time, I needed that hand up as well so that I could escape the, the, the treacherous lifestyle that I was having. And so when I got exposed to real estate investing or financial education, rather leveraging real estate investing, I really, really had to learn about the different strategies, the different ways to approach this to create the sustainable financial results that I was looking for. Because way too many people, including myself, it was very much very, very much the old school thinking in the sense that it was just buy, rent, and hold. You always start with buying properties first. And if you're not trained in any way in terms of, and this is not about trained, getting trained on how real estate works, because we're if you want to learn how real estate works, you're probably going to get trained by your provincial or federal or wherever you live. The real estate board, they have courses for you so that you can become a licensed real estate agent, or you can become a licensed mortgage broker, mortgage agent, or inspector, valuer, appraiser, whatever it is, you name it. Here, we are training to be real estate investors. That once again, you know my stance on it, so I'm not going to back down on that now. We are investors, meaning we learn how money can work for itself leveraging real estate. And so many people, when it comes to real estate, 
as we all probably have experience with, is that they put properties first. They get themselves onto maybe a few listings. They've got their real estate, either friends or relatives or just a random real estate person, or they go to open houses on weekends or and during weeknights after work. And they think that that's where they start. And usually when that happens, again, no disrespect. However, there are a lot of agents that are out there who are basically what we call hand to mouth. They are sales professionals. Their job, meaning how they make money and most of the times how they make a living is through trading properties for their clients, meaning buying and selling. It's really funny because these days we are refocusing on building our U.S. portfolio as well. We're looking to scale it further. And uh, I remember six months ago in this particular market when I was physically there, all the, all the realtors were saying, hey, you know what? You want to buy now, buy now, buy now, simply because, well, every single listing is getting multiple offers and the price is just going up, 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 up. So you better buy now. And now six months later, the market's cooled down quite significantly. And they're still saying, buy now, buy now, buy now, even though they're not, the, the prices have now pretty much stayed stagnant and some areas even decreased and there's no, there are no longer multiple offers. They're still saying, buy now, buy now, buy now. Back then it's buy now so that you can catch the wave. Now it's buy now because you don't have competition. Regardless, they will always find a reason for you to buy. And so like I said, no disrespect because not all agents are created equally, just like not all investors are created equally. And this is why through a lot of my language, I think many of you, if you've been following me, you understand why I am so passionate about differentiating real estate investors versus just real estate buyers. Those are the amateurs. And I don't say that with any sort of... Um, prejudice or anything. It's simply a matter of mindset. And this right here that I want to share that I want to share with you today is mindset first and foremost. However, it will do you wonders when you're looking for funding. Why? Because so many people think that when you're in real estate, oh my God, money is always going to be a challenge because we're dealing with bigger item products. Chances are, if you're in the North American markets, it, properties are running six figures plus in any decent market, okay? So I know some pockets are not like that. Let's not get into the nitty gritties right now. However, what that means is not everybody can get into the game. But what I'm telling you here, though, is that, yes, with the proper pro approach and with a proper process, everybody can go into the real estate investing arena properly. And so this is why... You go into real estate investing really knowing full on as a person what your financial goal is. Because I've worked with so many different investors and so many different students from all different parts of the world now to learn that we all come in for different reasons. Some of us are here to supplement our day-to-day -day income. Some of us are here to build a legacy, set a different example, or break out break out of our old school money blueprint that our parents gave us, the society gave us that no longer serve us. And some of us want to just set a different example to show their children that it is okay to break out of the mold. Some just building a better retirement. Some want complete financial freedom like myself so that I can tell my boss to go, mm. I'm not going to use those figures, by the way. <laughs> Again, I didn't get the privilege to do that simply because I was actually laid off. However, because of the financial education and the portfolio that I was able to build, I didn't have a lot of properties when I declared financial freedom. And this, once again, goes back to the mindset because I remember mentioning this during one of the episodes is that how do you spot, how do you spot an amateur investors or a regular property collector is that they will simply ask you, how many properties do you have? Now, I don't know about you. After all these years, I'm still a strong believer in the fact that I would rather have five properties and declare financial freedom than having 20 properties and still need to slave myself into a job because they're not performing well. And this is why everything we discussed so far based on strategy is all performance driven. So coming back to goals, goals will determine the strategies that you want to go into. So for example, John Smith here can come in and say, hey, you know what? I make $120,000 a year, but 
My goal is to fire my boss in the next three to five years so that I can have complete financial freedom, replace my income, live the life that I want to do. Versus Jane Smith could come in now and say, you know what? I am a mother of two. I have a very decent job. My husband is still working. We actually don't hate our job so much. However, what we do realize is that even though both of us have secure income, false sense, by the way, even though both of us have, I'll just say steady income streams at the moment, we realize that we're not able to afford the finer things in life. For example, we want to give our kids better presents for Christmas, for birthday, for special occasions, or we want to go on better family vacations, and we're not able to really reach that. Everything's done on a budget, and it gets very tiring. We work so hard, and why does it always feel like it's never enough? And so, yes, cue the song from The Greatest Showman. It just kind of hit me. But coming back here, though, this is why we always talk about the fact that you have to learn to let your goal dictate the strategies that you go into. And so what do I mean by stra strategies? For example, distress properties is a strategy. Okay, that's where you learn how to find distressed properties and learn to add value to it, to add additional protections. And this is where everybody gets introduced into the burr process as well. Now, wholesaling is a strategy and lease option is a strategy. Commercial properties is a strategy. Income property is a strategy. And then you have single family, you have multifamily. I know this is uh, a bit of a review for some of you. However, I really do want to make sure that everybody understands that it really isn't just about buy, rent, and pray. And then we also have what we call service accommodations. Okay. I can never spell this word right. Accommodations. And so for many of you, it's what we call short term rentals. Now, remember, we don't call it Airbnb because Airbnb is simply a marketing platform that many, many investors that are in the service accommodation area or short-term rental area leverage to market their properties. I'm a true believer that my entire portfolio should not live or die based on one marketing strategy. Okay. And with that say, you can also bill. So do uh, infills, land development. Now, a lot of these development, okay, let me spell that out properly first. <laughs> and many of these are what I call hard strategies, meaning you go to uh, take one of these courses, then you understand how to execute on that strategy. But these are hard strategies. There are some soft strategies that are absolutely, absolutely critical and necessary, if not more necessary because these are the transferable skills. First thing first, because we're learning how money works for itself, creative financing is always going to be one big thing here because when the traditional banks say no, what do you do? You gotta get a little creative. And this is where you learn about seller financing or AKA vendor take back and leveraging different paper instruments or contracts to really help you structure a deal properly to create ultimate win-win situations between you and your money partners. I'm assuming money partners simply because most of the times when you have to go into creative financing, it means that you personal, your personal resources have already been maxed out and you're still continuing to grow and looking to scale. And so you're now involving other people to come in and to go on this journey with you. So we like to say that creative financing, really, you're learning how to share the wealth properly. With that said, though, some of us are not naturally uh, born good at speaking to things, explaining things, or better yet, selling anything at all. And this is why we always say uh, raising funds for your business is, whoops, raising for, <laughs> raising funds for your business is absolutely, absolutely crucial. Whether you think you are a sales dynamite already, a superstar in it, it's always very different. If there's one thing that I found, because I did come from corporate sales background, is that when you are looking to build relationships with your money partners, it is not as cut and dry as here are the numbers, here you go, give me your money. It is never about that. Like I said, it is always about other people's goals. I get asked these questions all the time. How do you find money? 
is by showing that you actually care about what their financial goals are. It's not just about yours. And that's why most people will actually take creative financing and raising funds for your business hand in hand. One's more of a hard skill, the other one's more of a soft skill. Now, given that we are leveraging real estate as our main investment vehicle to create income streams, well, tenant management and property management are super important, except that we look at it purely from an investor's perspective, because we're not training you to be a tradesperson to come and fix the roof, to fix the windows, to fix the sidings, to fix the, uh, the foundations or anything else that could go wrong within your hard asset, that is the property. Or we're also not really training you to become a property manager, because the whole idea is to be able to buy your time back and so why would you buy yourself another job by managing your own properties? Now, I get it in the beginning. If you only have one or two to start, you can get some street experience. So later on, you might feel a lot better when you pass your portfolio over to a property management company or multiple of them like we have because we do invest in different geographical areas across the, the globe. Now, with that said, though, we always look at things from a pure, pure investor's perspective. So that basically is your strategy. And so, well, strategies that are available to you. So for example, many people that say, hey, remember the circle of wealth? If you still keep your regular job and because you have a good income, you've been at it for a while, you don't hate it. In fact, you love it, you enjoy it. And you only have a few more years to go before you have to retire. All you're looking for is to secure a better retirement, meaning you don't get trapped into that 40, 40, 40 plan. You work for 40, year, uh, 40 hours a week for 40 years only to retire with 40% of your highest income. Well, we all know that it's a little difficult to really downgrade your lifestyle, especially when you don't have to. And so say for example, if that's the situation, most of you will likely go into distressed properties. You'll combine that with income properties and you'll learn how to do lease options, maybe even a little bit of commercial and in creative financing. By the way, forgot to mention, this is also where you learn how to do private lending as well via real estate. And then you might go into service accommodations and that's about it because most of these strategies are designed to give you the passive income so that you can cover your passive income, your earned income, meaning your active income, as well as your equity income. Some of you might say, hey, you know what? I don't care. I'm really getting sick and tired of sick of being sick and tired of my job and not climbing the corporate ladder, or there's just way too much competition in the job market right now. It's just so hard for me to get to where I wanna be. I've been, the, I've been in the workforce for 10, 15 years now, and I've only gotten promoted twice because I keep on getting beat out by other candidates because everybody else is more qualified. They have better degrees. They have more experiences, whatever the case may be. Then we focus on helping you exit that situation by maybe combining distressed properties, wholesaling, lease options, and maybe even infill and lend development, depending on your appetite. All these are always a given, regardless of which hard strategies that you go into. And so what that means is once you've picked your strategies, let your strategies determine the viable market that will support the financial results that you are looking for. So for example, when it comes to distressed properties, one of the exit strategies for distress is to simply flip a property. And I think even for those of you who are huge TV fans that have watched some of those flip shows, you understand it always starts with a property that is physically distressed more often than not for nothing else. They're very entertaining to watch. However, if you're an HGTV trained investor, please, please do yourself a favor. Really, really learn how to do things properly before you actually execute. And that is the honest truth that I have to share with you. So coming back here, you can go into distressed properties and say, if you want to simply flip and your goal is to supplement your income or to replace your income, let's just assume that it's $50,000 a year, okay? And your goal is to do flips. Then you wanna go into a market where it's one deal and then you can make 
$50,000 in profit, or you can do two deals at $25,000 in profit. Give you a quick example. I live in Edmonton, Alberta in Canada, as many of you know. I'm in a market where $25,000 per flip deal right now is, is the responsible and safe calculations. Whereas you can go to a market like the Vancouver region or the Ontario, parts of Ontario here in Canada, and you can get much, much better flip profit at the end. And so it really just depends on which markets you want to pick at that point. And as you can hear now and see from that example, everybody's risk tolerance is a little different. And so I know for some of you, you're going to say, well, hang on a second. If I can just do one deal at 50K, why would I want to do two? Because then that's doubling my own job for myself and double the amount of work. Absolutely. However, it comes down to risk tolerance. Some people that don't live in their home market, which is not what we teach, by the way, but some people, they will say that it's not my home market. I don't want to go uh, venture out into another market yet until I've executed on the strategy once or twice. Sure, that's your that's your personal decision. Just so you know, when you do work with a mentor, we're very much result driven and we're very much numbers driven. So you're going to get a little encouragement and a little push to push you outside of the comfort zone so that you can achieve your results much faster. Because really, that's what having a mentor is all about. Having a trainer, having a coach, following the footsteps of those who have done it in the time frame that you want to accomplish them in. And then once you've actually determined, narrowed down on your market, then you pick the properties that will actually serve you. And this is why we always say you want to do SMP instead of PMS. So yeah, get it? Okay, never mind. I think I'm funny sometimes, so you can, you can decide. We all know that it's not the best way to approach this. However, we do get in that scenario where we go to open houses, we probably get emotionally engaged in looking at properties. Maybe the profit has already been maxed out because whoever's selling you that property or listing that property to sell, they were the investor. They, brought, they bought it distressed. They already put in the value add and now they're selling it back to you at retail. And what's gonna happen is if you're working with an agent, chances are it's their bottom line that they also need to look after. I'm not, again, once again, I'm not saying that they will do whatever it takes or say whatever it takes to get that sale done. However, for the most part, it is the harsh reality for many. And so what we're up against now usually is an agent, a seller or a selling agent, because it could be a home builder as well, saying whatever it takes, things like lots of potential in this property, in this neighborhood, in this area to get the property sold. And now once you've got the property under contract and you've taken possession, meaning you're now on title, your only exit is to buy, rent, and pray. So you've bought it, you're gonna rent, find a tenant for it, and you pray that the property will stay in good shape the entire time that you own it so that in 20, 30 years, you can cash out with that big chunk of equity during retirement and that you will never ever have bad tenants that'll trash the properties or damage it even, or even pay rent late because the world is so perfect all the time, right? <laughs> So with that said, coming back here, though, really the heart of all of this, as I said, SMP today is more about SMP for financing. So what that really means is that SMP is a process. People forget that when you have processes, when you have a system that becomes, that makes you a viable business, especially when you can prove that your business model is profitable. Once again, is your business model going to be profitable when you follow goal SMP? Absolutely, because who here is setting out a goal to lose money from the get-go? Nobody. And so when you do goal SMP and you've acquired enough deals under your belt, you can now go back every single time. And I will promise you this, you will always going to have offers as in, offers or commitment, depending on the countries that you're in, from lenders for financing. You're never going to run out of money when you can prove A, your track record that your business system works, and B, it works 
at making money regularly, securely, and safely. And so that's why we're so big on SMP as our process, not just to use it as a tailored method to help each and single one of us achieve our own financial results. Because again, my results are different from yours. And my goals are still different from yours. I, I, I'm guessing, really. But take it to the next level. It goes beyond just satisfying our personal goals and personal desires. It's the fact that if you're running out of money or worried about running out of funding when you're on the journey to scale your portfolio, don't as long as you are following the process that I'm sharing with you. So stop PMSing and start to apply SMP so that you're able to build that track record and you will not have the headache like most people do. So on that note, I do wanna share with everybody because as I'm recording this today, I believe it is what? Monday, October 18, 2021, and the Trust for Talent community, we are putting on our last boot camp of the year. It's a free boot camp on how to create financial success through strategic real estate investing. And that is going to start this Saturday, two days intensive boot camp, five hours each day. We will be starting at noon Eastern daylight time. So for those of you who are in New York, Florida, or Ontario, that's the time zone that you are in. So noon to five for two days, okay? Noon to five. So a total of 10 hours coming your way to really provide you a new blueprint. And you're going to get the opportunity to get the one-on-one -on -one consultation on how you can create and tailor that path for yourself after the boot camp. So without... Um, Beating, uh, beating, uh, beating it the, the, the point even more. I just want to say thank you for joining me again. I know it's a longer episode again, but I do do hope that you are taking this all in, and I hope that you uh, you join us during the boot camp. I will share the registration link for the boot camp right below in the comments section as well. And if you do have any questions, feel free to message me, email me rather. And if you like what, what it is that I'm sharing or that you think there are people that are able to benefit from a different type of mindset when it comes to investing, please share this with them. I would greatly, greatly thank you for it because that is my personal why. My personal mission statement is to create a thousand millionaires through real estate by the year 20. And I hope to see you as part of that plan. Thank you once again, and I will see you at the next episode. Bye, everybody.